Persecution for the sake of the gospel of Christ can take many forms. Yes, it can be violent. It can involve prison, even death. But it can also look like harassment, like a propaganda campaign, or what we might call libel. Brother Silas was a lawyer serving Jesus in the former Soviet Republic of Turkmenistan. This was one of the early ways that he experienced persecution. They wrote an article about me saying I'm criminal, leader of these sects, you know, betrayer that like works for the foreign governments, you know, trying to smear you, your name, and scare people that, that will not associate with me. Jesus never promised his followers an easy path. In fact, he told his disciples that the world would hate them. He sent them out as sheep among wolves. Jesus' words came true in the life of the apostles, and they're still coming true today in the lives of his followers around the world. Join host Todd Nettleton as we hear their inspiring stories and learn how we can help, right now on The Voice of the Martyrs Radio Network. Welcome again to The Voice of the Martyrs Radio. My name is Todd Nettleton, and we are in the studio today with uh, another one-name guest. We're just going to call him Brother Silas. Brother Silas is from the nation of Turkmenistan, and I don't think in the history of Voice of the Martyrs Radio we've ever had someone from Turkmenistan before, so this will be a very interesting conversation, very uh, insightful about a part of the world that most of us aren't very familiar with. Brother Silas, welcome to Voice of the Martyrs Radio. Oh, thank you. Thank you for having me here. Uh, let's talk about growing up in Turkmenistan— you experienced the transition from part of the Soviet Union to now an independent country. What was that like, or, or what did that transition change for the people of the country? Yeah, du during the Soviet time, you know, I was born in 73, 20 years of Soviet Union, I experienced a communist regime in Turkmenistan. You know, even though majority are Muslim, Muslim people in, in Turkmenistan and the culture is, a, is the Middle Eastern or the Islamic uh, most of the time, but also people adapted into Russian communist culture there too. And I, all of a sudden in 1990, I was like just graduating from high school, uh, the Soviet Union collapsed. And for a lot of people, it was like a restarting their lives. I mean, it was in a lot of uncertainty and, and losing everything, kind of restarting all every aspect of their lives, you know, in, with a new country. For us, it was like a uncertainty how 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 life will continue after the Soviet Union. Your, you know, kind of normal normalcy of communities and life all of a sudden changed. You was know? there excitement too? Like like. Like we're our own country, we're in control now, or was in, there fear? What? Yeah, or, I think the majority of the population, it was like, why this happened? We want to stay, kind of interesting uh, in in Soviet Union because you know their lifestyle change. Growing up in Turkmenistan, your adopted mom would would teach you Muslim prayers mm -hmm. and some verses from the Quran. Yeah. This is during the Soviet time, so yeah. so they're not looking to promote religion. They're not looking to no. promote Islam. So at the time, did you feel like that was something sort of secret or dangerous? Or, or how was that to kind of have that Islamic teaching at the same time you're in a country where they don't want you to be religious? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the mainly what they did, like uh, Islam in Soviet Union, and particularly in Turkmenistan, was practiced more in the culture the lifestyle people, you know, weddings, burial, you know, births, uh, giving names, you know, always uh, in, involved some elements of Islamic culture and uh, traditions. And I think that over the years, Turkmen people learned how to kind of appease the communist regime, not, not to like oppose openly, but finding ways how to, they can practice and pass their religion to their next generation, you know, communist Interesting. Uh, regime. Yeah. We're talking today on Voice of the Martyrs Radio with Brother Silas. He is from the nation of Turkmenistan, born into an Islamic family during the communist rule of that country, today a follower of Jesus Christ, and we will get to that part of his story in just a minute. Silas, as, as a young man, you, you said you were an atheist in your head, but you were a Muslim in your heart. Tell me what that means. You know, like I, as I grew up, uh, my mom— 
she tried to do all the right things, and you know her character was excellent. And and she, at the same time, she she tried to also like um, practice some of the traditions of Islam, taught me some of the prayers and different things. But as I grew up and became a teenager, I tried to find the answers to my questions, like a spiritual questions, like why there's a death, if there's Allah, God, then why he's so far away, no no closeness and how I can stand before him. And, and I couldn't like uh, find uh, answers to my all those questions within Islam. But then all the schools in Turkmenistan at that time was a communist school. The teachers taught you that there's no God, even though they were also themselves like cultural Muslim, but they're supposed to tell and teach uh, atheism. And since I couldn't find the uh, answer, right answers that uh, satisfied my soul, I thought maybe, you know, the atheism makes sense. There's no God that people created this religion. We're culturally Muslim. That's why I became like more atheist. So it's very much was an identity thing. Yes. I, I'm a Turkmen. Yes. All Turkmen are Muslims. Yeah. So I'm a Muslim. Yeah, that's even that's, if I don't believe it, even if I don't practice right. it, it's just part of who I uh-huh. am. That's that's uh, I think the reality for many many people uh, around the world, and particularly from the former Soviet countries. I think uh, a lot of people, you know, identify themselves the same way. They not necessarily practice practices of Islam mm-hmm. actively. They have a kind of a life of an atheist, you know, you can say. But then, the but if moment, you ask them, they would the, say, "The oh, moment I'm a you ask them, yeah, or moment you, they they hear the about the gospel or Christianity, they say, oh, 'Oh, I'm a Muslim,' you know, and I don't want to, I don't want to. <laughs> I haven't been else. to a mosque in the last twenty years, but I'm a Muslim. Don't <laughs> right. talk to me yes, about Jesus. That's that's yeah, that's that's a reality. Yeah, for many and that's people. that's as you say, that's true. A lot of places in the world. Well, I've heard that from Turks. I've heard it from mm-hmm. you know Malays in Malaysia. Oh well, I'm. You know, yeah. that's a part of who I am. Yeah. So you're a practical atheist, but a heart Muslim. Yes. And your brother-in-law tells you that he's now following Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> what did you think of that? How did you respond to that? Yeah, it was interesting that we, like, we never talked even about uh, Allah or Islamic uh, religion, traditions, anything about, about our religion with him. You know, but all of a sudden he, he he says that he's a follower of Christ. That shocked me. That statement really shocked me. And I was like, uh, what are you talking about? This is, from my understanding, the Christianity was mainly practiced by Russians or Slavic people. Because I think it's, again, we grew up only knowing Christians and on the TV and, you know, some of the books, we, we saw those big, you know, Orthodox church buildings right. with the crosses and icons and Russian priests, you know, in, in their, like, uh, amazing closings and, you know, different rituals. But the person of Christ, uh, the stories about his, his life, what he did, and then some of his, teach, you know, teachings that he was sharing really attracted me to him. I wanted to know more. And then at that time, there was a... Jesus film, uh, which is based in the Gospel of Luke, dubbed into Turkmen. We didn't know about it, who did it, you know, how it was done. And and it was avail- available. God, you know, orchestrated everything. And my brother, uh, my father-in-law actually bought a first uh, VHS player in his village. <laughs> and that was a rare commodity, you know, right after this collapse of Soviet Union. And very few people had it. But, you know, God orchestrated everything. And they, they get hold of that, that movie. And the moment I started watching the movie, I heard Jesus speaking Turkmen. And hearing Jesus speaking my tongue, my language, the gospel became real, not only knowledge to my head, but it was like personal, and it was touching my soul, my heart. And as I watched the movie, the life of Christ, everything he did, his perfect holy life, his teachings, and, and his death and resurrection answered all my questions that I had about, you know, from young age, I, I was scared of death. I was worried about my sins and how I can stand before, you know, judgment's throne of God. Whether, is there going to be like eternal life? How, how we can, you know, solve this dilemma of death and all was answered in Jesus Christ. And one of the challenges of Islam is there's no way to know for sure what's going to happen to you after you die. 
Yeah, there's uh, like a, I grew up uh, hearing the story or the the concept of how to crossing over to heaven. And there's a concept in Islam and teaching says that there's a bridge between hell and to to the heaven. The bridge is thinner than hair, sharper than sword, sharpest sword in the world. And there's a fire underneath of that bridge. If you have enough good works and if you followed everything, maybe you can make through through that bridge. Maybe. Maybe. And there's no guarantee. And it's, it was very scary and, and still scary for many, many people. And you, you, you live in like in that hopelessness. And that, that was my condition. But Jesus answered. He said, you know, you worried you about the death. Jesus said, I came and I conquered the death. I, I died for your sins, for your punishment. And through his resurrection, he proved his eternal life. And he gives eternal life to everyone who believes and the peace that I longed, you know, I didn't have this peace in my heart. Even though I grew up like an only child, you know, a lot of ways, like uh, in Islamic cultures, the male sons are spoiled in many ways. If you only ch- son, it's like you, you know, you spoiled extra. And even though I had those, you know, privileges, still my heart was empty and meaningless. And the moment I, I accepted Christ into my heart, I experienced this peace and joy I never experienced before. And Jesus says, come to me, those who are weary and burdened, and I give you my rest. That, that resonated powerfully in my soul. And the, his words, you know, come, even you die, I will resurrect you. You know, I am the resurrection, and, and I am the way, truth, and life. And all those words, like, really answered all my questions, and I was ready to give my life to So him. did you make the decision, uh, like, as you're watching the film, you're like, I am, I'm in 100%, yeah. or was there, like, a decision period after you saw the no, film? No, no, I, I, I think I watched twice the Jesus <laughs> film. The first time and the second time when I watched, the, the Holy Spirit really Amen. touched my heart. And in the end of the movie, I... I accepted Christ and prayed with a prayer, and I believed in him, and then experienced that joy and peace. Amen. We're talking today on Voice of the Martyrs Radio with Brother Silas. He is from the nation of Turkmenistan, uh, now a follower of Christ, born into a Muslim family. So you get to the end of that film the second time. You you know I'm going to follow Christ. Was there any consideration or any thought of, this is going to cost me. Like, this is not going to be a popular decision. Uh, you know, what is my family going to say? What That moment, those questions didn't cross my mind at all. You know, I was overwhelmed with joy, peace, this good news. I went to my village. Like, you know, in the story of Samaritan woman, Jesus uh, meets her and reveals himself to her, and she runs to the town telling everyone, you know, uh, about Jesus, similar way, you know, I was rejoicing and went to my village. I started talking about Jesus nonstop, uh, my experience, you know, what I learned. Uh, my mother, who was 75 years old at that time, all her life she was, you know, Muslim. She was waiting for that news, good news. And the moment she heard about the gospel, she gave her life to Christ. And some of my siblings, some of the neighbors, you know, responded to the gospel. You know, initially, um, several friends accepted Christ, but all of a sudden, as I saw more people in our village started hearing the gospel, some people started responding negatively and at some cases with anger. And So you know. what, what was the pushback? B- because your argument with your brother-in-law was, that's a foreign god. Yeah. We don't do that here. I'm a Turkmen. Mm-hmm. Of course I'm a Muslim. Is that the same thing you It heard? was the same. Most of the time, that's, that was the same response. Actually, it's very funny. They started like a, making a r- rumors or the gossips about me. They said Silas became a ru- Russian priest and he has a cross on his neck and he's like converting people into Christianity or Russian religion. That was a an overall talk. So it's like, my, stay my, away from him. Yes, he's stay away he's from become him. a spy. Yes, he's a Russian yeah, now. Yeah. He's yeah. That's that's mainly the response of people. Because they don't, they don't, you know, they have the same understanding. 
uh, about the religion. The yeah. other thing that's really fascinating to me about your story is your brother-in-law talked to you after he'd only been like three days yeah. walking with Christ. Yeah. You immediately went out and started talking to your mom, to the rest yeah. of the village. There must just be such a sense of excitement yes. coming out of the bondage of Islam, coming to a Jesus who speaks your language yeah. that you like couldn't help yourself but tell everyone. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the impact of uh, the gospel in, in, in our lives and, and finding answers to those questions— you know, about the salvation of the soul and the death, the conquering death of Jesus, you know, resurrecting from death, promising eternal life, uh, forgiveness of sins, uh, those concepts. I mean, it's foreign. We never heard about those, and so many people never heard, and that's why we were excited to, to share that, that, that good news with, with our people. And it was a natural, like a, the Bible says, like a joy of a salvation, you know. It's like you— you have this joy in you that is not based on your own things. It's from God, you know, because God revealed his love to you, revealed his salvation, and and revived your spirit through his Holy Spirit. And now you like filled with joy and you can't stop talking about him, you know. That was a, that was the experience that I had. And nobody told me even like, go, you have to now evangelize. Or you have to be, you know, in order to be a good disciple, you have to evangelize, you have to share. Nobody, like, discipled us or told us, but it was a, like, pure, you know, Holy Spirit giving this joy of salvation and experience of salvation in Christ. And then we were naturally going and talking about it. And I remember, like, a, if you read the Gospel of John, you know, there's a few episodes where, like, a, you know, Andrew and John and Peter, they find each other and they bring them to Christ. You know, that was the same way. Like, we didn't know a lot. Like, theologically, we were not uh, learning uh, because we're new believers. We're first believers, you can say, uh, in the entire, like, five million people, maybe we're first five, six, ten believers wow. in the entire nation at that time. And So yeah. how much of the Bible was available to you? I was given first the Word of God as a, like a little uh, New Testament, uh, Gideon's Bible, they call it, with the Psalms in it, in Russian. In Russian. Like a pocket okay. book. But it was in Russian. Right. It's like, again, you know, you proving my case. You know, God, God is Russian. His Word is like also in Russian. Look at it. You know, there's no word in Turkmen. But later, I think the 1994, the... Gospels were translated into Turkmen was available in the capital city. Somehow they hold on, get hold of one Bible in Turkmen, New Testament actually. And it was uh, shared among like maybe 50, 60 believers in that wow. time in early days. Yeah. And, and we didn't have anything else. And, but later on, you know, we, we were given like a New Testament in, in Turkmen when, you know, especially when I went to capital city. So... You knew the the day would come. You mm -hmm. would have to pay a price. Right. You mentioned some in the village now are mm -hmm. starting to push back. Right. What did that look like when when they pushed back? You they started rumors about you. Did they actually come like physically and attack you, or there was no uh, no physical attacks, but like ostracizing you and some of my friends like uh, didn't want to you know have friendship with me anymore, and some people didn't want to talk and. Some of my relatives, you know, kind of giving a cold shoulder and not, not happy about me. My own dad was against it. He wasn't like a religious at all. My biological dad, I mean, he was like more, you know, same way, atheist mindset. But I didn't like it. And I had some issues like a more like kind of threatening and people getting angry at me in my neighborhood, you know, like neighbors. Some of the teenagers came to the Lord like a... 13 years old, 14 years old, you know, um, and then we had a small youth group, you can call it, that their parents responded very harshly, and they, they came to me, and they were threatening, angry at me, you know, why are you doing this? And But later, like, after I moved to Capital City, I went uh, to university, studied international law, and became a lawyer, and also was leading little congregational fellowship within the Russian registered like official church mm -hmm. 
who had that. And so you had some legal protection because you were under the Russian yes, church. Okay. Yeah. Not more people uh, were coming attracted into into Christianity when it was in the, within the Russian church because it, it proves their case. Right. You know, their misunderstanding. See, it's foreign. Yes. Oh, okay. They say like, oh yeah, you're inviting us into Russian church, and for them it was hard to understand that. Uh, uh, you know, Jesus didn't come like bring the Russian culture or a different culture. He bring, he brings a transformation of lives um, and character and new life in him. To communicate that, we later on ended up like going into the villages and saying that this is not not Russian. It's, you can speak in your language. You can sit like like yourself. You can worship God in your own culture, uh, but based on the truth. You know. That's why I later on God called me into kind of a full-time ministry. I was a lawyer at the Minister of Foreign Economic Relations. I left my job to uh, preach the gospel and establish churches uh, in the capital city and surrounding areas. And there, at that moment, when I got engaged in that, then I started having, you know, severe persecution. In the beginning, they were like kind of raiding our church meetings, house churches, and then banning us to 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 have a meetings. You know, early stage each time. I mean, I I was a trained lawyer. According to the Constitution, you can choose your religion, not to choose your religion. But they they claimed that, but in reality, they were going against uh, those like uh, uh, our rights. And in a sense, I was like trying to protect our community and saying, hey, you know, you, you, you guys chose this. Now we have a constitution, we have a secular government. Why are you doing this? But they were like, yeah, you know, but we follow the orders, yeah. you know, uns- unwritten orders from, from above. And I couldn't believe that. You know, I was, no, it shouldn't be that way. But they increased the persecution as, as we rejected to stop gathering, stop preaching, sharing, and and they they one time they they wrote a, a big article in a central newspaper. They wrote an article about me saying I'm criminal leader of these sects, you know, you know, betrayer that like works for the foreign governments, and they, you know, trying to smear you your name and scare people that that right. will not associate with me. And and that was a one one way of doing it, putting different kind of pressures. One time they came. And arrested me several times. They arrested me, and and they sent me back to my village, thinking banning me coming back to the capital city. And then when I returned back, they they took my in Turkmenistan. Usually, to live in a city, you have to have a permit from the government, and they canceled my permit uh, and banned me legally staying in the, in the capital city. And then they another time they arrested me. Then they came uh, into our apartment. And my wife and two children, three, four years old, they throw them into the street, all our belongings. They, they sealed our doors and banned us uh, to, to enter. And we were like homeless, didn't know where to go. You know, all our belongings were on the streets, my wife crying with the two baby. Yeah, different ways of, uh, you know, increasing pressure more and more. You could put a stop to this by what? By saying, okay, I'll be a Muslim again? Or by saying, okay, I won't tell anyone about Jesus? Yeah, they, or? they don't care necessarily probably, you know, whether I will say like I'm Muslim again or something like that. But they, they cared more. I will stop every activity that I was so doing. So no more church meetings. No more church planting. No more no evangelism. Leading, no, no, yeah, no preaching. Nothing then we'll like leave that. you alone. No, yeah, we'll leave you alone. Just believe in yourself. Maybe you can do, <laughs> but don't, don't do any okay. Christian activity. We've been talking with Brother Silas here on the Voice of the Martyrs Radio. We're going to cut in right there partway through his story. Next week, he's going to be back and share part two of his story of persecution in Turkmenistan. In the meantime, if you want to hear more stories like this one, you can always go to our website, vomradio.net. We have every past episode archived there. You can also search for Voice of the Martyrs Radio or VOM Radio on your favorite podcast app. 
A lot of times you can hear a longer version of the conversation online or in the podcast than we have time for in our broadcast window. Again, that web address, vomradio.net, or search your favorite podcast app for VOM Radio. I'm Todd Nettleton. I hope you'll be back with us next week to hear the rest of the amazing story of Brother Silas and God's faithfulness to him right here on the Voice of the Martyrs Radio Network.